My number 11 pick is Nightbreed the Action Game, based off the horror film Nightbreed by Clive Barker back in 1990. The game was released at the same time, developed by Impact Software and published by Ocean. In fact, the programmers of this game also were involved in games such as uh, Trailblazer, Run the Gauntlet and Death Wish 3. It's a very, very colourful and graphically impressive game. Presentation wise it's actually superb to be honest, uh, lovely intro music, a great drawn title screen and loading screen should I say. It's got uh, all the options you need and lots of nice in-game effects as well, lots of fire effects, explosions, the, the background lightning is particularly nice, lots of layered graphics as well, big chunky loads of colour, it has a lot of atmosphere to this, this game. It is a maze style game, you're creeping your way through the, the death city of Necropolis and the underground Nightbreed city of Midian. The object of the game is to play as this character Boone and collect three keys to Midian and eventually gain access to the end of game boss, The Mask, where you rescue your girlfriend. Never heard that one before, have we? The game itself is actually pretty playable. Lots of moves, you can uh, shoot a lot of things, there's lots of things to collect. Uh, many, many enemies and all very well presented and um, yeah, it moves well. The sound effects are pretty decent also. I do find, however, you get lost very easily. The collision detection can be a little bit dodgy now and then. Sometimes you don't really know what the objects are. You can't really see objects very clearly, sometimes layered behind other graphics. And you do kind of get yourself into a bit of a tiz uh, once you're making your way around. Once you know your way, it can be a very, very enjoyable game. Presentation wise it's actually rather superb and that's why it makes it into my top 11. Very unassuming game and sometimes forgotten.
Night Hunter was released in 1990 by Ubisoft, and it's a pretty decent platformer game. Based off Bram Stoker's Dracula, uh, all the guests in the castle, the castle of Transylvania, are out to get him. They've got nice uh, stakes and crucifixes and lots of things. You can stop old Drax, but uh, of course you can have a go at them as well. Grab them by the neck and drain their blood. It's very detailed in mode one. Excellent really looking graphics and animation is ut utterly superb. The, the pace is maybe a little bit slow for some. But I think uh, the animation is excellent. Uh, Dracula's skinny legs a little bit. You can transform into a werewolf you, for jumping over holes and punching people. You can transform into a bat for flying over distances at quick speed. Collect the keys, explore the castle and grab the manuscripts. There's plenty of levels here to be getting on with. It's a quite expansive game. And eventually defeat. There he goes. You're sucking someone's blood there and they drop into a pile of bones. Lovely. The flying witches. There's lots of stuff going on. It's a very good game. What could uh, I improve about this? Well, the title music is a little bit lame, doesn't really suit the game. Uh, maybe a little bit of scrolling would be nice. Maybe a little bit more atmosphere. Uh, and maybe a little bit more uh, colour. Some use of rasters in the main game screen would have been good to give it some colour. I'd possibly say that. And uh, definitely some more effects going on. It's a little bit quiet in the game itself. Also, moving around the castle can be a bit monotonous sometimes, going back to the same areas, repeating the same things. That can be a bit dull and a bit slow. Not for everyone this game, but I think it's got a lot going for it.
Written by the Oliver Twins and published by Co-Masters, 1986 brings us Ghost Hunters. It's got that sample speech thing you'd expect from these kind of Oliver Twins games. And lots of little uh, cultural nods there. Love the little ghost in the logo, top corner. Very good. It's got a mode one color palette. We've got blues, reds, and blacks and whites. So it's very restricted color wise, but movement wise, it's actually very, very good. There's a little bit of screen flicker here and there, especially sprite flicker, should I say, not screen flicker. But lots of moving things going on everywhere. Enemies, uh, icons you need to pick up. There's the synthesized speech. Surrounding graphics are very nice as well. And of course, you've got your terrorometer and your macho energy. And when your macho energy is gone, you're dead. You are Hunk Studbuckle, and you've got to go and rescue your brother in the Haunted Mansion. What's interesting about this game is its uh, shooting system. So you, when you want to shoot something, you stand still, press fire, and you can move the target around to shoot the skellies and the vampires and the ghosts and the, the zombies and whatever appears. And you've got to shoot them quick because that brings your terror meter up and that drains your macho energy. So not even if they're ever in need, you've got to shoot them straight away. Shoot them, sir! I do like this game. I think it's got a good approach to things. It's got a unique interface for sure. The shooting element is sort of very unique indeed. And I think the fact that there's loads of going on the screen, lots of movement is excellent. The colour scheme is kind of off-putting for me. It's a little bit too red. Uh, lots of red going on. Sometimes very garish, even though the sprites do have a lot of detail. It's also maybe a little bit too tricky to navigate yourself around the mansion. Sometimes I, I find myself getting stuck in rooms and completely lost. But I tell you what, it's uh, it's definitely a challenge and it's definitely got that uh, Oliver Twins mark of uh, quality on it. So coming in at number nine is Ghost Hunters. So here we go, back to the world of bullet hell vampire shooters with Chibi Akuma's part two, or episode two, should I say, confrontation. 
This was the game that basically topped the first one in my view, so that's why I've selected it to be in the top 11 of best horror games for the Amstrad. The version playing at the moment is the CPC 6128 version, not the plus edition with the additional uh, colours and hard sprites and all that kind of stuff, because uh, I think it plays nice like this. So we've got Chibiko, we've got Bokum, we've got the expanded character universe in this, we've got the improved game engine, we've got the burst mode. Everything's going on in this game. I think this is a little bit more balanced than the first game. Even with the recent update of the first part, I think the second part is still my favourite. Confrontation is the game to be playing if you like this kind of bullet hell style shooter. It's got all the comedy elements in there as well, of course, um, an expansive story. Yeah, the one with speech bubbles as well, speech bubbles in game. Scrolls nice. For the amount of what's going on on the screen, it scrolls particularly nice. And there's big giant sprites, loads of movement, lots of effects, background music, everything. Yes, it can slow down sometimes due to the amount of stuff going on. It can be a bit flickery. The constant deaths could annoy you, but it's good fun. It's a great blast to be the bad girl for a change. Chibi Akuma's Episode 2, Confrontation.
Palace Software's 1985 release, Cauldron, is a bit of a stonewall classic for all Amstrad fans. An absolutely marvellously presented game, this graphically is very pretty as well. It's not the, I mean, it's not the best you've ever seen on the system, but graphically it's pretty and very apt and suitable for the game. The flying bits like this are particularly enjoyable and very, very playable. Even with the flick screen, you can forgive it. However, the platform elements of the game are overly hard. We're getting into, um, you know, over the difficulty of Manic Minor level of hard for the uh, platform sections. So that can be sometimes unforgiven. However, you can get hold of extra lives. And it's all about finding the keys, getting in the right places, and collecting the ingredients to create the potion to defeat the evil Pum King. Yes. And you play as the titular green-haired hag indeed. Yes, sir. <laughs> that was a terrible voice to do, wasn't it? Here we go with some uh, piranha plants, uh, a la stolen from Super Mario Brothers, I think. Yeah, like I say, the music to this is fantastic. The, the, total, the total screen music is one of the best soundtracks uh, on the Amstrad. It's really good stuff. Could do with a little bit more music maybe in-game. That would have been uh, very welcome. But there's plenty of effects going on as well. It's a very well-polished game and a very playable game. Unfortunately, too difficult on these platforming sections where you have got to be absolutely pixel-perfect on everything. It's extremely unforgiving. If you're an expert games player... Cauldron is the game for you. Nineteen ninety one saw the re-emergence of an old spooky sitcom in the form of a film, The Adams Family. And of course, a game film time was done immediately by Ocean, of course, they got the uh, license. And this is the Amstrad version. And a fine game it is too. 
a 128k only game. Extremely colourful, very playable, very controllable. It has to be because it's bloody, bloody difficult. Very difficult. This is pin sharp platforming action. Very pin sharp. You've got to be really on the money when it comes to the platforming and your jumping. If you thought Cold Room was hard, this is even harder. However, this has beautiful graphics to enjoy, loads of excellent um, visuals, shading, lighting effects. That's. You know, it's it's very good looking, very good looking. Based off the film's characters, of course, you've got to go and rescue the rest of the family. I think you have to collect keys and give them keys and then rescue mini, um, and then complete mini games to save them from something within their own house. Why? Not sure, but that's the plot, and you play as Gomez Adams himself. You've got a great little rendition of the Adams family theme on the title screen. There, unusual to use, of course. A uh, We've seen this on a few games in the past where a mode 1 title screen, loading screen is used and the game of course is in glorious mode 0 with much colour indeed. Good sound effects too. Uh, as I say all this comes down to very very good controls, very sharp and very responsive and like I said it has to be. Unfortunately I'm not going to get any higher on this list because it's so damn difficult. It's so damn difficult to the point where it would do, even if it, even if it was a little bit more easy on the frustration level, it will probably come in at 2, but uh, for this list, it's where it is. Taking the number 5 spot is Werewolves of London, 1987 released by Areola Soft. Areola Soft. I think I said that a little bit wrong, didn't I? Sound a bit rude. But anyway, Werewolves of London, uh, based off the original um, 30s film, I believe. And this is a rather fantastic game. It doesn't look like it should be, but it is. It's um. It's got a particular art style to it that makes it look very cartoony. I mean, big, big blocky buildings, really ginormous colours and all that kind of stuff. Um, quite, um, or could be a little bit off-putting, very reminiscent of the Amstrad graphic style. And some of these um, character sprites look a bit hilarious as well. But I tell you what, the actual mechanics of this game are rather fantastic. You've got the day to night thing going on here. And you see I'm just about to change back into my human form. Here we go, and you can see the sky colour changes, you've got the backdrop of London there in the background with Tower Bridge and stuff. Um, and you've got a little uh, cloud and the sun at the bottom there which in indicates the day to night, so it indicates when you're going to be transitioning from your werewolf to human form. And yeah, it's pretty expansive, an expansive game that you can easily get lost, um, you can certainly have to draw yourself a map to get around. And uh, the object of the game is basically hunt your family members down and eat them essentially 
to lift the curse on you. You have a curse of being a werewolf and find find your family members and kill them. All of life's avoiding being killed yourself or being arrested by the police because the police get angry about uh, people walking around dressed as, uh, well, turning into werewolves and killing people. Yeah, they're a bit funny like that. But uh, yeah, it's a really engaging game this. It takes a while to get into but it's a really engaging game. Uh, I do like the uh, change of music score as well when you go from human to werewolf. The effects are minimal but present. And uh, But everything is very, very clear. You've got the little... Uh, Animate, an animated HUD at the bottom, which is really nice, your energy meter being the blood meter. Obviously you have to eat innocent people to uh, keep your strength up, a bit like the vampire game we saw earlier. But yeah, bold colours, brash stuff, nice music score for a relatively early game in the Amstress life cycle. This is a cracker. Uh, can be a little bit daunting to uh, walk around following people sometimes. There is a massive strategic element to this game. Some people might not like that, but to be honest, I think it's a rather spiffing game. Wells of London, it's got a little bit of bite.
If you thought the Amstrad was missing some frantic arcade style action, then Invasion of the Zombie Monsters is your ticket out of there. This is a just absolutely brilliant game. It would have been an absolute bestseller if it had come out back in the day, that's for sure. This came out in 2013 by Revelo Software. Big Loads of production on this, loads of people involved in this, and it, and it shows. It's an excellent spin on the sort of ghoul, ghouls and goblins, ghosts and goblins kind of genre. Um, so, yes, you're your hero boy, you've got to go and uh, he's been endowed with some moonshine energy superpowers and he's off to rescue his girlfriend from the zombie horde with lots of other little flying skulls and other alive plants and whatever you have. You've got everything going for this though, everything's going for this. Collect the little uh, coins that pop out there, a la Sonic the Hedgehog's kind of style. Graphics are absolutely brilliant on this, really lovely, brilliant, uh, brilliantly done graphics. Uh, the movement is excellent, the animation is excellent, the scrolling is utterly superb as well. This is how you do scrolling on an Amstrad, it's excellent stuff. Collision detection is also very, very sharp, as is the platform detection. Um, controls are also very sharp indeed. Uh, occasionally when things get busy it can get a bit jerky and a little bit slowy, jumpy all over the place. But outside of that, it's fantastic. You've got lots of uh, continues and lots of lives as well, so plenty to get on with. You've got a little map there indicating the beginning of the stage. Very uh, Ghosts and Goblins, kind of almost um, reminds me a bit of Castlevania as well like that. But yeah, this is an excellent game. You can while away the hours on this game. It's, very, it's got a real arcade feel to it with this epic story going into it. It shows you all that. It's got a really nice little theme music going into it. Music playing in the background in-game as well. Apart from the slight uh, sort of tearing that you get in game when you when the, on the vertical scrolling, that's really the only thing bad I can say about this. This is an excellent game, really good stuff. Um, pushing the Amstrad, I believe, but it is essentially still a run and gun. So it's not the most complicated of games, but certainly a very proficient one.
Codemasters released Striker in the Crypts of Trojan in 1992, and uh, it was specifically geared for the Plus Machines as well, or a version of it at least. And graphically, it looks absolutely spectacular. Not only on the Plus Machines, but also on an, an original CPC. This is what we're seeing here. Really high detailed graphics here. Very well textured backgrounds, really detailed sprites. Lovely smooth slide scrolling there. Not the flip screen scrolling we've got, we've got smooth slide scrolling. Excellent animation on the main sprites as well. Little point icons there coming up sometimes when you pick an item up. Yes, so basically collect the spells, collect the parchments, make your way through the game and defeat all the evil enemies, skeletons, zombies, all the usual horror tropes. And uh, yes, a lovely little platformer game this is. Excellent stuff. The graphics are absolutely spectacular. Got a really nice music intro screen there. With some great animation uh, on the intro screen, to be fair. It's excellent stuff. It really is. You really get into this game. It takes your day away, that's for sure. It really does. Movement on the main sprite takes a while to get used to. I've got to admit that, uh, especially the jumper mechanic. The jumper mechanic is a little bit odd. You've got to get used to that. Uh, but with lots of things moving around all the time, many hazards, lots of platforms to jump on. There we go, just jumped into that skeleton hand by a complete accident. Yes, loads of things going on. A very clear HUD as well. Uh, spell levels, energy levels, life bars, all that kind of stuff. It can all be deciphered. So yeah, the whole game is rather excellent all over. And played on the Plus machines, it is especially fantastic to see something of this high quality on the Amstrad. I defy anyone who can't see the quality of this game. Uh, sound effects, lovely little jingles, great tunes, superb graphics, some of the best seen on the CPC, especially if you have the Plus version. This is no strike, it's a surefire hit. Super Cauldron is one of those games which every Amstrad fan knows about. Released in 1992, this is the third instalment to the Cauldron series. The license was picked up by Titus Software because unfortunately Palace had gone under by this point. And my word, what a game this is. It has everything that an Amstrad fan could possibly want. It has the high color graphics, it has the smooth movement, it has the scrolling, it has numerous sound effects, a good storyline, loads of gameplay. There is not much more praise I could give Super Cauldron. So we control Zamira here, the little pretty witch who's off to make a super spell to defeat the uh, evil shenanigans of whatever monster is uh, the flavor of the month. 
Story aside, that's not really the issue here. The issue is the fact that this game plays and looks and sounds fantastic. It is so much enjoyment you can have out of an Amstrad. Massively arcade feel game, it really is. Um, it pushes the Amstrad to its possible limits. Uh, a normal CPC, this is. This runs on a normal CPC. It's got m overscan on the top screen. Overscan in the in-game, for goodness sake. I mean, that, that takes a lot of skill to do. This was programmed by Elmar Krieger, uh, the same guy that gave us actually games like Zapti Balls and uh, Prehistoric 2. So the art style is very familiar. This cartoony, very high coloured, quite high detailed style, uh, which became his hallmark really. The scrolling is smooth, the movement is smooth, the hit detection is absolutely great. Loads of little effects going on, like lightning in the background, little bushes waving in the um, foreground. Excellent stuff, it really is. Um, frantic at times, very difficult in parts as well. In fact, to progress for the whole game, it isn't very, very difficult indeed. The graphics are actually lifted from the PC version, I believe, and they're also very closely associated to the 16 bit versions and the ST and stuff like that. Uh, the game is shorter than those versions of the game uh, to compensate for the Amstrad's limitations, but you don't notice it. You really don't notice it. Um, I think the whole stage, in, in fact, is missing. But uh, with this high kind of quality graphics, kind of quality gameplay, grab factor, returnability, and just awesome sound as well. There's everything going for this game, it really is. Some people may think it's a, a little bit jarring, a little bit flickery for them. They'd be nitpicking, they really are. This is probably one of the highest quality games on the Amstrad, full stop. And it would have won this list if it wasn't for a certain remake that came out very recently. It took many years of development, but it was worth the wait. The remake of Ghosts and Goblins for the Amstrad Plus and Geo 4000. Now, the original game, if uh, Amstrad fans will bear with me to remember, was overly difficult and cut down from the original arcade and NES versions. Of course, it only had three levels, you got hit once, you were dead, there were no pickups, there were no change of weapons. It did boast an absolutely incredible soundtrack, and the graphics at the time were very, very good, and it weren't a bad little game in itself. 
but it felt incomplete. It didn't feel like the Ghosts and Goblins of the arcade. This, however, captures everything from the Ghosts and Goblins arcade, including its high difficulty, even though it's slightly easier than the original Amstrad version. But look at that absolutely glorious scrolling. The playability of this is absolutely second to none. It is like you are playing the arcade machine. Graphically, obviously, it's not that spot on, but it's vastly, vastly improved over the original version. Xyphos and Targon did an absolutely excellent job in bringing this to the GX4000 and the Plus machines. Everything is included, I believe. It's got all the bosses, it's got all the weapons, it's got even the shield weapon at the end there. When you get hit, you get knocked into a pile of bones. Well, when you get hit, you don't get knocked into a pile of bones. You get actually down to your pants, which is what the original joke in the original game was, of course. And then you get another hit, like that. so, you see? Unbelievable, this game. Um, the fact that it's running on an Amstrad, pretty incredible. We even got the transitional map screens and things. All the music has been redone from scratch, based off the themes of the original arcade. The sound effects are all present. I just still cannot get over that uh, scrolling. It's a, just amazing scrolling. It's like you are playing the arcade in your home. The original ad advert for the Amstrad GX4000 years ago said it's like bringing the arcade home and this game actually demonstrates it is like bringing the arcade home. If this game was released on cartridge it would have sold a load. It would have sold a load because it is an absolutely superb conversion of an absolute classic. And it is my number one horror game on the Amstrad. It has to be. It's brilliant. It's utterly, utterly brilliant. Thank <laughs> you. 